You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. First of all, he was not shot in the head. Most people believe that he was pistol whipped. He suffered some severe lacerations. Had he been shot in the head at point blank rage, there would never have been a um, Tupac death row. He'd have been dead right then and there. He was pistol whipped over the head when he tried to pull his own pistol out of his waistband in the in the heat of the moment. He was trying to pull his own pistol out and he shoots himself and that bullet goes through his leg, through his groin and back in, you know, so he, um, he shoots himself. Yeah, so for instance, in Las Vegas, Tupac had no business running over and assaulting Orlando Anderson. That was not Tupac's business. That was gang shit that Tupac shouldn't have had anything to do with. Uh, and so when he decided to take it upon himself to go and act like he was, um, you know, representing this gang, that's when he made a, you know, he made a fatal mistake. So they start putting the wheels into motion to go and retaliate. They know where Tupac's going to be. They know where Suge's going to be. They go and uh, approach a guy who um, was affiliated with Bad Boy, at least a guy that was affiliated with Puffy. And uh, they say, hey, you know, we have a beef now. This guy offers to give them a gun. He gives Keefe D, which was Orlando Anderson's uncle, a gun. They get into a car and then they set off to find Tupac and Suge. Uh, Suge Knight obviously now has lost not only his bodyguard, Jake Robles, after the shooting in Atlanta, now he's lost Tupac in Las Vegas. And, uh, you know, for all intent and purposes, they're kind of losing the war. And so, you know, he knows that he has to answer um, for the murder of Tupac. And so he sets things in motion in order to have Biggie killed. No, Suge Knight's not ever going to sit down and tell the truth to law enforcement. You got to understand who Suge Knight is and the nature of Suge Knight. I mean, he's uh, Suge Knight is about Suge Knight. And Suge Knight's about Suge Knight only. He doesn't give a shit about justice. You know, a lot of people out there that are, you know, um, attaching themselves to conspiracy theories. And there's people that are out there thinking Tupac's alive. There's people that are out there thinking that Suge killed Tupac. There's people that are out there thinking the government killed Tupac. There's people that are out there thinking the police killed Biggie. So, you know, there's all of these different points of view. Um, I know what I know, and I believe what I believe, and so I'm settled with that. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Greg Cadding, a 20 years detective, LAPD, Works in one of the biggest unsolved murder cases, both uh, Biggie and Tupac. You came in, was it nine years later, Greg, for this case? Yeah, well, Tupac was murdered in 96 and Biggie in 97. I didn't come on the case until 2006. So, yeah, approximately nine years yeah. after after uh, B.I.G. Was, was killed is when I began to work on the investigation. First of all, how are you, brother? I am really good. Thank you. Um, you know, we're just kind of rolling with the punches over here in the U.S. As I know you guys are kind of rolling with the punches over there in the U.K. and just trying to figure out what the world's going to do with itself. Yeah, it's crazy times, but all we can do is soldier on. I always go back to the start of my guest. First, Greg, just to get a bit of information about yourself, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, so I grew up in California, um, Northern California initially and then moved to Southern California and, uh, you know, typical childhood played sports, had friends, got into some trouble. And then when I was uh, about 20 years old, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do with myself. And a mentor of mine, who was actually a friend of mine's dad, um, encouraged me to join the sheriff's department and he was a sheriff. And he says, you know, Greg, you're, you're kind of aimless right now. You don't have a whole lot going on. And I needed a job. And so he suggested I apply for the sheriff's department. And I did. And I got a job. And I went through the academy. And then I decided I wanted to transfer to Los Angeles because I thought it would be more exciting to work up in the big city. And so I applied for the LAPD, went through another academy, and then uh, ultimately um, began working, start, you know, my, continuing my career 
in Los Angeles and did that, you know, collectively for 25 years and then retired in 2010. And uh, because of the big investigation, I wrote a book uh, after retiring and then it kind of went on its own journey into documentary and limited series and and podcast. <laughs> yeah, very popular. Obviously, uh, such a massive subject, two of the greatest rappers of all time, two young kids with such a high had such high popularity at the time, kind of just going through the ranks. And obviously when that stuff happens, it's it, it brings eyes from all around the world. But how was your, before we start, kind of, what was um, going through the academy like for you, Greg? Um, it was not too tough. Um, you know, the academy's made, uh, well, it, it it tries to weed out the people that probably shouldn't be there. So intellectually, if you just don't have the capability of wrapping your head around law and uh, if physically, if you don't have the ability to just to perform at a standard level and uh, and then ethically, you know, what kind of person are you? And so, you you know, I, you know, if, if you're a decent human being in decent shape with decent intellectual capabilities, you can get through the academy. Um, but if you're flawed in any of those areas then, you know, you're going to struggle and probably be disqualified. Because you've worked 200 cases, I believe, for LAPD, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, when you're going, it, it, you know, cases, what does that mean? So it, when you're working as a crash officer, I worked gangs for a long time, and you investigate a lot of gang crime, and then I got into narcotics and investigate all types of narcotic activity, and most of the time gang and narcotics were all integrated and, and um, you know, collectively working, and then um, homicides, I started in a cold case. And so we would just go through old cases and old cases and old cases and seeing if there was anything that needed to still be done or if there's any new evidence. And, and collectively, I think, you know, over the period of time that I was assigned a cold case, I reviewed about 200 cases. How many gangs are in LA? How many different gangs? Oh, hundreds. There's, there's, there's too many to count. I mean, it's hard to keep track. Um, and then, you know, because we had gangs and then we had tagging crews and, you know, is there a difference between a gang and a tagging crew? And so, you know, you've got to differ differentiate what you mean, you know, by a gang, um, you know, car clubs sometimes would be perceived as a, as a gang, um, motorcycle clubs could be perceived as a gang. So it really, there's just so many different facets of it, but just the typical gangs, as we kind of think about in in common parlance hundreds of them hundreds of them and some were small and some were large some would have hundreds of members and some would have you know 20 members who was the toughest gang you'd seen or came, came up against obviously you've got your bikers your mexicans and was it was a, a certain gang that stood out for you that was very well organized well they're all very loosely organized actually they're not they're not well organized it's, it's not organized like we consider like the mafia yeah. or you know organized crime but um they're organized that there is a hierarchy there is you know the ogs shot callers and then the young kids and the guys that go out and do the crimes and then the guys that are selling the dope and the guys are just hanging on so there's all different kind of components to it um you know obviously the transnational gangs like the, the you know the the uh, the El Salvadorian gangs, particularly uh, Marta Salvatrucha, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm drawing a blank on the, the one of the biggest gangs in the world right now from El Salvador. But those are huge nas international gangs. Uh, then you have your local gangs, you know, and they're all dangerous in their own in their own way. They're all capable of creating havoc, um, but some at just much larger levels. Yeah. You know, so. Um, the like the black gangs were more or less localized to L.A. And then, of course, over the years, they began to spread. They kind of tether out into Atlanta or Detroit or, you know, it, originally it was just Bloods and Crips in Los Angeles. And well, now there's Bloods and Crips in cities all over the all over, you know, well, all over the United States for sure. But probably little facets of them outside of the United uh, States. Gun crime. And U.S. is massive. Not so much here in the U.K. It's more knife crime. Yes, guns are used, but not as frequently. Were you ever in danger yourself, Greg, by getting shot at in America? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember one time we were I'm driving in a black and white. And, uh, I mean, I was in danger. I didn't even know about it. You know, we were driving through a park, 
and uh, it was late at night and I heard a loud boom and I'm like, shit, I think that was a gunshot. And I remember I thought we had hit something in the park, like ran over a, you know, a big branch or something. We got back to the station and there was a slug, uh, a shotgun slug hole right under the passenger side door. So it went, it passed right under the door where I was sitting, didn't even know about it at the time. Um, you know, cause we're driving through the park and the, the car's kind of bouncing around. I hear a loud shot and we figure out shit, somebody had just shot at us. Um, and of course, when, you know, you're, you're chasing people down dark alleys, you're in danger because you don't know if they're going to turn around, if they have a gun. And so those type of things were commonplace. You know, those were really kind of like everyday activities where you would be, you know, in danger, but being in danger and being in fear can be two different things. I was never really in fear, um, even though I might've been in danger. Does that ever make you question your job though, Greg, when, you're, when your life is in danger is every time you put on a uniform? Well, it can be. I mean, because what are you doing? You're going out and confronting the worst of society's ills oftentimes. And you're also just confronting people, even decent people, that are at their worst. So you go to a domestic violence scene and everybody's emotions are running high and people think that, you know, the world's falling apart on them and you do desperate things when you're in those positions. So you can get into situations where, nor, you know, um, uh, people that would normally be compliant and cooperative all of a sudden don't because they are just so amped up over their own desperate situation, whatever it might be. So, um, y- yeah, you, you never know what you're going to encounter. You put on the uniform, you get in the car, you answer radio calls. And you never know what's around the corner until you get there and try to figure it out. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. I've had a few. I've had a few police officers on the podcast, and people don't realize from the rough areas and the estates we have in the UK. It's kind of you kind of grew up to hate the police, but once you actually listen to people's stories who put on a uniform, you don't realize that the extent they actually go through that seeing the dead bodies, even car crashes, like having to go at scenes. And I had a man on and there was a kid cut in half and they had to just wait until the ambulance was there. But as soon as obviously it was the, the bonnet of the car that was keeping the body together, like some s- s- sad, sad stuff. And a lot of people then seem to turn to drinking drugs who are police officers, especially in the UK. Everyone I've had on have had kind of, I believe there's, the PTSD plays a big part and a lot of trauma from, from what they see because it's not a humane thing to see all that kind of stuff daily. How does it change you as an individual, Greg, to be in such a tough job? Like, do you become cold towards society, your family, or is it just put a uniform on, come home and switch off? Or how do you adapt to that? Well, that's a really good question. And I think, you know, generally speaking, like you hit it on the head, it's an individual thing. It's like, how are you built as an individual, what kind of stresses and pressures can you endure? Um, how do you manage that stress? And, you know, do you turn to the bottle? Um, do you turn to drugs? Do you turn to being, a, a, you know, an isolationist where it's just like, I don't want to hang out with anybody but cops because they're the only people that understand me. You know, so it, it, it depends on that individual and how he decides to process these stresses and these unusual situations. Um, you know, oftentimes there's guys that just don't take the job too seriously and that's healthy. You've got to be able to hang your uniform up, go home and live your life away from police work. Um, but there's other people like myself, for instance, that get consumed by it and it becomes, um, you know, it becomes more important in your personal life than it should. That You need to have a line, a professional line and a personal line. And some people blur that line like I did. I, I was so committed to police work that, you know, oftentimes my family um, took a back seat and, uh, and that's not good. That's unhealthy. Um, but at the same time, the best investigators, the guys that really are going to probably accomplish the most are those guys that are so committed to the job that they're not going to let uh, one stone go unturned. So it's really, it's a tough thing. Um, but you do have to be aware of what it's doing to you psychologically and emotionally And I think law enforcement today recognizes that better than they ever have in the past. You know, there's behavioral sciences that are looking for these flags and type of things. Um, But back in the day, let's say the 60s, 70s, even 80s, you know, it's like, hey, you know, toughen up, handle it. You know, don't play a puss. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's why a lot of people struggle to this day because as men, we don't really speak about our feelings and emotions. Greg, if you've seen something in the 80s, 90s, like you say, it's toughing up. It's, it's part of the job. Deal with it. Do you know what I mean? Like, that, that's a tough thing in itself. But then again, it's easy now to speak out because we've got social media and everything. It's kind of the end thing as well. Like people just love to speak out and, and it's a good thing. But So see, when you are going through your career, did you know anything about Tupac when you get shot in like 95, 96? Did you know anything about them? Those no. shoes? No, I didn't listen to that kind of music. I mean, obviously, um, y- you might hear on the news or might be aware of the fact that, you know, these... Uh, these prominent musicians or these prominent uh, artists have uh, have gotten killed. But no, I wasn't paying attention to it because I didn't listen to that music. And even at that time, I related that music to the type of street activity that I didn't admire. You know, I mean, when, when you have, you know, prior to these guys being killed, just think you've got NWA coming out with fuck the police. And there was very much a, um, a per- perception um by not only the police department but the general public is that this is anti-social type of music anti-social behavior and that's the way that i perceived it it wasn't until i started working gangs and understanding gangs and then of course hearing music that was gang related that i start to appreciate you know where's this voice coming from what are they talking about what do we need to do to kind of kind of uh, uh, merge the gap that is taking place between the perception of the people on the street and law enforcement and the perception of law enforcement to the people that were on the street. And not that I was, you know, looking to tolerate crime, but understanding oftentimes where is this coming from and trying to understand why do people feel this way? And is there a way to kind of heal these wounds? And so that's kind of always been, obviously today it's still the challenge. See when NWA released that song, Fuck the Police, did you, did you see a rise in violence towards police or did it not really matter? Was it just a case of people singing that song when you're driving past and all was a rise yeah. in violence? Yeah, do you have, I'm, I'm not sure which year that was, but listen, in, in the late 80s, 90. okay, early 90s, yeah, because yeah. in the late 80s and early 90s, like gangs were just, gang activity was off the hook in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were gang-related murders every single night and i'm not exaggerating sometimes two three five even ten across the city like there was so much gang violence um and uh so when you correlate well what's happening and then this music that seems to be kind of not maybe glorifying it is too strong of a word but you know um tacitly supporting it he, he, he it's hard to say you know i respect the music when it's emphasizing something that is causing so much damage in in the in in the cultures in which um, um, the music is being really respected and played and um, emphasized. Yeah, do you think that stuff was just putting more fuel to the fire that was already lit between gangs and the police at that stage? Anyway. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. At the time, for sure, I would have I would have thought that absolutely. So. 2006, you got the call to work two of the biggest unsolved murders in America, especially in the music industry, two of the biggest hip-hop stars. How yeah. how does a man of your caliber then get the call for that job who didn't really know much about it? Well, I'll tell you, there's two parts of it. One is that the, the Biggie case was being handled out of our robbery homicide division. So this is one of the, uh, it's a downtown unit that handles all the higher profile murders in the city um you know at back at that time excuse me there was 18 different divisions patrol divisions in los angeles each of those patrol divisions had their own homicide units for instance biggie got killed in wilshire division so originally biggie's murder was being handled by the wilshire homicide detectives but once it looked like it was going to be um, a more challenging case to solve and take more resources it went down to the headquarters homicide unit what called robbery homicide division <clears throat> so they had been working on it for as we mentioned nine years at that point and and then there's this lawsuit against the city claiming that cops were involved so the people down at robbery homicide division were like hey we're we need to put fresh eyes on this we need to take a new approach to this and, and the, so the department looked to recruit people that had expertise in the areas that they presumed were 
relevant to the murder. Gangs, um, obviously cold case homicide, uh, potentially narcotics, um, large organized um, complicated cases. And I had been working those type of cases for years. So my name came across the table and the people at Robbery Homicide Division are like, hey, Greg, are you interested in working this case? Along with other people, of course. And I said, hell, yeah, of course, I would love to. Let's let's see if we can figure it out. So where do you start then from that case like a few years before? To, I'd imagine there'll be thousands and thousands of files and paperwork. And where mm -hmm. do you start then when you, when you get a, a case like that? <clears throat> Starting with what has already been done, you've got to go back and familiarize yourself with the case itself. You've got to go back to the crime scene back to all the things that led up to the murder. If you think that there was some kind of premeditation or you've got to think what, what was, what kind of conflicts were going on that might've been a motive for this murder. You've got to go and, uh, you know, uh, educate yourself on everything that um, is already known um, to the, you know, to previous investigators. And so, as you said, there's just thousands and thousands of pages of material that you have to review. You've got to figure out what is, has been done, what hasn't been done, what's your new strategy that's going to, you know, hopefully succeed um, where it hasn't in the past. So there's just, it's a tremendous amount of work. And so my, my idea um, or our idea, I should say, was to like, let's get subject matter experts in every field. So well, we know these are firearm related crimes. Let's get somebody who is an expert in firearms, um, the gang related crimes. Let's get people that were experts in gangs, not only gangs in general, but gangs specifically. That's why we brought Tim Brennan in from Compton because he had been working gangs in Compton. We knew that Southside Crip was somehow, Southside Crips were in, related. Uh, Suge Knight was affiliated with the Mob Piru. So we got people that, so we brought in all these subject matter experts to build a team. And that was the initial investigative strategy was to build a team. So we'll start off with two pack. Like the connection in 1995 when Tupac was shot five times in New York, was this the start of it all between Bad Boy Records and Death Row Records? Or was it on before this? Well, yeah, no, there was no beef at that point between Death Row and Bad Boy because Tupac wasn't even with Death Row at that point in time. When he was shot in New York, or when he got beat, I should say, in New York, in 1994 um, or 95, he wasn't even assigned to death row at that point in time. So there was no, you know, there was no beef going on between them at the time between the record labels. What about P Diddy and Suge Knight? Was P Diddy's entourage, did one of P Diddy's entourage not kill one of Suge Knight's entourage or bodyguard? That was after the incident in New York. So the, Shooting between Suge Knight's bodyguard and uh, um, P. Diddy's buddy. Um, that was in 95, I think, in Atlanta. And that was after the thing that happened in New York with Tupac. And so, and even at that time, Tupac was still not assigned to death row. Do you think that's that plays an effect on it, though? Because Suge Knight never let that lie because it was always putting it on P. Diddy, was he not? Absolutely, yeah. That was definitely the first time where the conflict resulted in physical violence so once you know now you've got somebody who's dead as a result of their um of the beef that they were having <clears throat> and everything kind of just began to get more and more serious um following that why did tupac think biggie and p did they got him shot what is the real reason behind that do you think suge knight could have been possibly in his head because he didn't like P. Diddy anyway? No, again, remember in 94 when Tupac was shot, he had no association with Death Row. He didn't have yeah. any association with After Shug. it though, after it, did Suge not get him bailed out? Or did Tupac automatically think it was P. Diddy and Biggie that tried to get him killed? Well, yeah, so at the Quad Studio, Tupac suspected that the guys at Bad Boy um, had something to do with it. So that was his initial... Um, you know, perception, but in time he began to realize that those guys probably weren't involved. Um, but he suspected that maybe that, that they knew something and they weren't telling him not that they set it up, but that they were aware of who did it and then weren't telling him who did it. So 
you know, it, it went from first Tupac thinking these guys had something to do with it. And then it was, okay, maybe they didn't have anything to do with it, but they knew about who did it and they didn't tell me. So that's how it kind of began to evolve. And then initially, fig, you know, Tupac figured out who it was, that it was Jimmy Roseman and, uh, um, you know, a, a New York guy that was behind it. So was it, was it just there to get robbed, Tupac? Or was no, it, it was to, to get killed? Yeah, no, it was to discipline him. Um, they didn't go there to kill him, obviously, because they could have just killed him if that had been their, if that had been their intention. Um, they, they, they beat him to discipline him because he was running his mouth about getting paid and kind of being demanding. And I think this guy, Jimmy Rosemond, was just like, okay, listen, you got to understand, uh, you don't dictate how things happen out here. I dictate how things happen out here. And are you going to raise your voice that, you know, um, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to send you a message. But five shots, man, that's more than a message. Well, first of all, that's highly, highly disputed. Um, there's uh, most of the evidence. First of all, he was not shot in the head. Most people believe that he was pistol whipped. He suffered some severe lacerations. Had he been shot in the head at point blank rage, there would never have been a um, Tupac death row. He'd have been dead right then and there. He was pistol whipped over the head when he tried to pull his own pistol out of his waistband in the in the heat of the moment. He was trying to pull his own pistol out and he shoots himself. And that bullet goes through his leg, through his groin, and back in you know. So he um, he shoots himself. And then, of course, his hand is lacerated because as he's grabbing the gun, he doesn't have a proper grip on it, which is one of the reasons why it accidentally discharged. And the slide came back and sliced his finger in the web of his thumb here. So um, the idea that he was shot five times, that's just urban legend. Oh, so that's a myth then? I, I always believed that as well, five times and I survived. All the songs, everything that you read, that that's the one that sticks out as well. I can't believe that, mate. I fucking believe that as well. <laughs> well mad. Listen, if you're going to write a song about what happened, you're going to want to make yourself look as badass as you can. So why not just say, hey. <laughs> Exaggerate <laughs> you know, that. But, you're yeah. not going to write a song saying, hey, I was getting my ass kicked mm. and I shot myself in the balls. You're not going to yeah. say that. How long after the shooting was Tupac sent to prison? Because he, when he was in prison, that's when Suge Knight approached him to... Suge Knight... Uh, approached him to pay for his bail 1.4 million if he gives him three albums like how far how long after the shooting was he sent to prison well it's a considerable amount of time because remember the day after he got shot or here i am saying it the day after that he was beaten um he has to go to court to face these rape and sexual assault charges and so he went to he went to jail shortly thereafter and then he was convicted and then he went to, you know, he was, he was going to prison. And so he's languishing away in jail and uh, probably looking back and being pissed off at everybody that he thought was abandoning him, including Biggie. And uh, that's when now Tupac at that time was under interscope with Jimmy Iovine. Well, death row with Jane. so jimmy was like hey i got an idea let's see if we can go rescue tupac and assign him to death row and you know make music and so suge's like that's a great idea i'd be happy to have him so they went out there and they made a deal to get him out of jail and bring him to the west coast do you think that was the start of tupac's demise teaming up with because out of everyone it looked as if suge knight was a proper gangster like he looked like a one one who didn't really fuck around that like, do you think Tupac obviously wanted a bit of protection as well before when he obviously got beat up in New York? Or what was his, what do you think his method of thinking was teaming up with Suge Knight? Obviously to get the bail money. But, but so, Sorry, I'm going off track here, but why did Tupac not have his own money to bail himself out? Was he skint? No, he didn't have his own money to bail himself out. Um, and he didn't have a lawyer that was working on his behalf. Now, here comes David Kenner, a very successful criminal defense lawyer. And bringing the money that um, that Tupac didn't have himself. And, and so that combination of a good lawyer, a crafty lawyer, and a, uh, a, a bunch of money 
um, is, is all needed is all Tupac needed. And so he makes a deal with the devil, so to speak, I'll do three albums for death row. And you guys pave the way for me to get out of here. Cause obviously more than anything, Tupac wants to get the hell out of prison. And, um, so that's 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 where that union started, um, but Tupac's demise started when he began to um, identify himself. Well, I shouldn't say identify himself, but when Tupac began to affiliate himself with the gang activity that was surrounding Death Row, getting involved in assaults and starting to you know just be very disrespectful towards his enemies and. You know, and then beginning to find himself um, ingratiated with gang members. And so when he began to align himself with these people, that was when the beginning of his demise. Yeah. So, for instance, in Las Vegas, Tupac had no business running over and assaulting Orlando Anderson. That was not Tupac's business. That was gang shit that Tupac shouldn't have had anything to do with. Uh, and so when he decided to take it upon himself to go and act like he was, um, you know, representing this gang, that's when he made a, you know, he made a fatal mistake. What's the rumor? How true is the rumor that P. Diddy was paying people money to take the chains, the death row chains? That's rumor. Um, it's never been substantiated. So there's uh, certainly the people at death row and the people within the mob Piru, they believed it to be true. And so they behaved as if it was true because they believed it to be true. Whether it was true or not, that's never been proven. We don't have any firsthand that I'm aware of any firsthand evidence that Diddy was actually making these, um, um, these, these offers of pain for a death row chain. I don't believe, I don't know if that's true or not. P. Diddy comes across as a professional entrepreneur, just all business. On the films and documentaries, it looked as if he was trying to sort things out. Do you think Suge Knight plays a part in that by saying he was paying people to take the chain so any one of the Bloods could then put it on him in sight? No, I don't think so. I just think it was a, it was a rumor that started. Um, again, we don't know exactly where that rumor started, but you know, Suge Knight was going to exacerbate any problem. That's just the nature of Suge Knight. If there's a problem, it's probably going to get worse if it has anything to do with Suge. Um, but, uh, you know, these are kids. You know, Diddy was young. He's a young man. You know, it's not the Diddy of 2022. It's the Diddy of 1994, 95, and 96. And so, you know, these were young, young people who oftentimes... Um, are caught up in the moment, making emotional decisions, and then paying the, you know, suffering the consequences of them. So they're just, uh, you know, I think that he learned a lot through his own mistakes. What what was the real charges of Tupac when he got sent to prison for the rape allegations and sexual assault? You see videos, he says he never done anything. It was a touch of a, the buttocks or something like, what is the true charges that he got sent to prison for? It was, uh, it, it was for him, it was reduced to um, sexual assault. And so it was reduced from like forcible rape to sexual assault. Nonetheless, he, he was convicted. It was still a felony and um, was going to do, you know, was looking at significant prison time. But yeah, the, the, the charges were reduced from forcible rape and to sexual assault. How when you started reading up on like Suge Knight and stuff, how were you wary of him and what he was capable of? No, I mean, I wasn't. I'm, I mean, I was, I didn't live in fear of the people we investigated. Um, you're not going to be a very effective investigator if you're running around in fear of the people that you're investigating. Uh, you have to approach it fearlessly and be willing to confront that world. I was never afraid of Suge. Um, in the sense that I, you know, had to lock my doors or carry a gun or anything like that. Um, but you did recognize the legitimacy of the, um, of the nature of that beast. But no, I, don't, I, I was never in fear of anybody that I investigated. So the night in Las Vegas, Shug, his entourage, Tupac, were at the Mike Tyson fight. 
uh, Mike Tyson won. They're going through the lobby. So why did they attack Orlando Anderson? They attacked Orlando Anderson because there had been a prior confrontation between the guy that was with Tupac that night in Las Vegas, a guy named Trayvon Lane, um, and other members of the mob Pyru had been at a mall in uh, outside of Los Angeles, and they ran into Orlando Anderson and some of Orlando Anderson's crip friends. They all got into a fight, and uh, allegedly the uh, death row medallion that Trayvon Lane was wearing uh, was either was stolen or it was stolen and then recovered immediately during the fight. We're not sure which is the truth. I'm not sure which is the truth. However, there was this conflict in that night in Las Vegas when Trayvon Lane looks across the lobby of the casino, he sees the same guy that had tried to steal his medallion and he tells Tupac, you know, there's that motherfucker right there that tried to steal my medallion. And then Tupac just took it upon himself to go over there and um, and uh, involve himself in somebody else's business. So they leave. What what's the what happens? What's the the steps of events then that lead up to Tupac's death after they leave the casino? They leave the casino. Um, you know they they already knew that they were all going to go to Suge Knight's nightclub out in Las Vegas called the Six Six Two. Uh, Mike Tyson was supposed to make an appearance there. Tupac was going to perform and do some songs there. So it's going to be an after party. And meanwhile, the Crips are all kind of looking at Orlando Anderson. Like, man, we can't just let this go. You just got your ass kicked in front of a lot of people by a whole, you know, by, by uh, 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 all of Suge Knight's entourage. So they start putting the wheels into motion to go and retaliate. They know where Tupac's going to be. They know where Suge's going to be. They go and uh, approach a guy who um, was affiliated with Bad Boy, at least a guy that was affiliated with Puffy. And uh, they say, hey, you know, we have a beef now. This guy offers to give them a gun. He gives Keefe D, which was Orlando Anderson's uncle, a gun. They get into a car and then they set off to find Tupac and Suge. So how obviously there's a lot of conspiracy theories around Tupac's murder. LAPD done it, like um, he done it himself because of the words that are in his songs. Like there's so much bullshit around this case that it is intriguing as well. That like, nearly thirty years later we're still talking about it because it is still high profile. Nobody's ever had a conviction. Like what what was your see before um, when you started working on the case between. 96 and 98, because Orlando Anderson was never convicted. Was there much evidence against him then? Well, there is circumstantial evidence against him then. We knew that he was the person with the with the motive. You know, he had just gotten assaulted by Tupac. And so there was always the obvious motive that, hey, this is probably the guy that came back and retaliated. But keep in mind, and this was... This happened in Las Vegas, not Los Angeles. And so there was never a conspiracy that LAPD was involved in Tupac's murder because that doesn't make any sense. We, The LAPD had nothing, no connection to that. He was killed in Las Vegas. So the really two prominent theories was that Suge Knight either had it done because they he believed that Tupac was about ready to leave death row. And he figured, well, he's worth more to me dead than alive. If he's going to leave, that was one of the early theories. It didn't really make any sense on the face of it because surely Suge Knight's not going to hire guys to drive up and shoot directly at him, hoping to hit Tupac instead. So that that theory is really always kind of weak. Uh, the more likely theory was that these Crips that had just been involved involved in a fight with Tupac came back and retaliated, and we now know that that is exactly what happened. Uh, after we got the confession of Keefe D. But there was circumstantial evidence. You know, there was um, reports of a white Cadillac being used. There was a, an association with these Southside Crips and a white Cadillac. Um, we had the video taped beating of two, Orlando Anderson that uh, occurred when Tupac assaulted him. So there was that type of evidence. But we had no really strong eyewitness evidence pointing the finger directly at Orlando. And that's why... Las Vegas law enforcement were unable to really make any real progress with it. Nobody was cooperating. 
everybody wanted to handle it on the streets. And I don't know how this is over in the UK, but in the street culture, in the gang culture in the United States, um, they have a code that you just don't cooperate with law enforcement. Uh, we'll try to figure this out on our own and we'll handle it on our own. And so that's why um, both of these cases essentially weren't solved because the people that were in a position to know things weren't able to or were unwilling to help. Did Suge Knight get shot in the head as well? Or is that another myth? No, it's kind of a myth. He, a piece of shrapnel or a, per, you know, a, a fragment of a bullet <clears throat> went under the skin in the back of his neck. It wasn't like a bullet directly entered his head and was lodged there. It was a piece of metal from a shrapnel. Whether that shrapnel was from the door, whether it was a piece of the bullet um, that had fragmented off, um, I'm not sure. But Suge claims that the metal is still you know, in his head. I don't know what the truth of that is, but I'm very confident that he didn't take a bullet in the head. So when Tupac gets killed in 1996, was the police expecting an uproar and a retaliation from Tupac's side and Suge Knight? Or did everything kind of calm down a bit? Well, you know, the police in Las Vegas are still, they're still trying to figure things out in the days ensuing after Tupac's shooting. Tupac's alive in the hospital. They're trying to figure out who shot this guy. And it's not a murder yet. It's just an, you know, an attempted murder. And, um, uh, but before they're even able to kind of wrap their head around what's taking place with these crews and with these conflicts, the war's already started in Compton. The Crips and Bloods have already decided to take this to the next level back on the streets of Compton. And that's where a bunch of shootings are taking place now as a result of Tupac shooting. Um, the kind of a little war between these two factions um, was was completely underway. I watched an interview with Napoleon and he says that it was Tupac's mom who switched off the life support machine. Is that correct? Yes. She decided that, you know, Tupac was, listen, even if he survived, Tupac's career was over in so far as his rapping. Uh, he, you know, they had to remove one of his lungs and uh, in order to keep him alive. Uh, Tupac was never going to be the same person, even if he had survived that, um, that assault. Um, you know, unless unless he figured out how to rap with one lung, but uh, practically speaking, um, his rap career was over. Uh, and so, you know, but Tupac was a strong guy. He was very creative. What he would have done with himself is anybody's guess. I, I, I'm confident he would have become successful in some area, but I just don't know if it would have been, you know, um, singing. Yeah, his mom saw that he was um, just circling the drain. You know, they had to do intercardiac massages three times, cracked his chest open, removed a lung. They had to sit there and massage his heart in order to keep it beating. And like they were just keeping him a alive um, synthetically. And so his mom realized like this is no life. This is no way my, my son won't want to live like this. This is what I believe went through her head. And she says, I don't want to have a son that lives his life on life support. So she pulled, she decided not to, not to resuscitate him after his heart stopped again. How was Snoop Dogg when he showed up at the, the hospital? Was he welcomed? Because I know him and Tupac fell out beforehand. Did they not? When he showed up at the hospital? Yeah. When Tupac I showed up at I think everybody was so focused on Tupac and his recovery and figuring out what happened. I think they were kind of setting the beef aside. I don't know if that beef between um, between Snoop and, and Tupac was ever that big of a thing. They might have had disagreements or whatever, but it wasn't the kind of beef that, um, that uh, was going to result in some type of uh, internal violence at death row records. So no, I don't, I think Snoop was just there to offer his support and everybody was, uh, was leaning on each other, hoping that Tupac was going to recover. So once Tupac, Tupac dies, Suge Knight is then recalled to prison for nine years, but did Suge Knight not get in contact with Orlando Anderson to go to court for him to then give evidence against him and say that Suge Knight never done anything to stop him from going to prison? Which did Suge Knight not offer money? like 50 grand to Orlando Anderson to be a witness for him? Yes. 
And so now after the, uh, after the assault on Orlando Anderson, which involved Suge Knight, he's seen clearly on the video camera assaulting. Now, Suge Knight was on probation. And so he was getting his probation violated. So as that issue is unfolding, Tupac's dead. Tupac dies six days after being shot. Suge Knight is now trying to stay out of jail himself. He's just lost his number one artist. Um, he's, you know, struggling to keep death row above water because of all of the drama that surrounded it. Um, his gang's at war in Compton, and he's trying to stay out of jail. So he says, listen, the, 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 the primary witness against me, Orlando Anderson, can also be my savior if I can get him to take the stand and, and, and uh, retract his statement. So he offers Orlando Anderson money. Orlando Anderson accepts it. Orlando Anderson goes on the stand and denies that Suge Knight assaulted him, even though everybody can see as clear as day right there on the video that Suge Knight is in, ta in fact kicking him. So the judge says, you know, hey, Orlando Anderson, you're full of shit. And he convicts, he um, violates Suge's probation. So yeah, it's just Orlando, it just kind of shows you the nature of Orlando Anderson. You know, he's willing to sit there and murder Tupac um, and then completely turn around and testify on behalf of his enemy, which is Suge Knight. So, you know, this is just some street shit that uh, shouldn't surprise anybody if you know the nature of these people that live and die, you know, within these gang cultures. Yeah, that's so messy. Like for the man who's killed Tupac, but then Suge Knight to be in contact from him to stand at court. And I can understand he doesn't want to go to prison. Did that ever raise question marks that Suge Knight could have possibly paid Orlando Anderson to kill Tupac? Mm, there was some speculation on that, but it, it didn't carry much weight. You know, it's a, you know, if, if, if Suge wanted Tupac shot, he had his own guys that could do that. He didn't have to go to some rival gang. It makes no sense for him to go and say, well, listen, I hate you guys. I know you're our enemies. We're at war with you. Hey, do me a favor. Come kill my number one guy. It just makes no sense on the face of it. Um, he had his, if, if that's what he wanted to do, he could have exact, he would have just hired, he would have asked his own people um, to go and take care of that. So when Tupac passes away, is it true that Biggie was broken hearted, crying and really upset that he was dead? Evidently, um, that's the story, and I, I believe it to be true. I, I, I think Biggie was kind of an unwitting pawn in all of this, and although Biggie did some things that kind of exacerbated the problem, I don't think Biggie ever wanted any, to see any harm to anybody. And, uh, you know, just recently, Little Cease did an interview, and he's describing what Biggie's emotional state was after Tupac was killed, and he said that Biggie was just absolutely brokenhearted that Biggie was truly, you know, um, in mourning over what had happened to Tupac. Obviously, P. Diddy kind of goes under the radar, but was he ever involved in anything? Was he maybe a mastermind behind some certain things or was he just, just trying to keep everybody at peace? Because did he not reach out to Islam to try and squash the beef between P. Diddy and Suge Knight as well? Yeah, that's the story that P. Diddy, he kind of wanted to squash the beef. You know, he wanted to make music, he wanted to produce music, he wanted to make money, he wanted to, you know, broaden the horizons at um, at Bad Boy Records. So yeah, that's the story, is that he wanted to squash it. Suge wasn't interested in squashing it. And so it just continued to fester and and uh, and lead to more and more conflict. But I think, I think that Puffy's primary objective was to avoid all of this the best that he could and just make music. And then on top of this, you know, you've got these young guys and they've got egos and Suge Knight's trying to open up Death Row East in New York, which is big, um, Puffy's backyard. Puffy wants Bad Boy West in Los Angeles, which is Suge's backyard. And so now they're encroaching on each other's territories. There's, you know, shootings taking place between their crews and it just got out of control. And they were too young and dumb to figure out how to avoid the inevitable, which is the murder of Tupac and Biggie. So the two, Tupac has just been murdered. The case is still ongoing. Six months later, Biggie is murdered. 
that then does that then drill fear into the police expecting another retaliation? How does how, like because it's still unsolved in Vegas six months later? Was it all? Was Biggie ever warned that his life was in danger, or was it unexpected, or what was the full full scenario? Why it happened to Biggie first of all? Well, the, obviously, after Biggie, I'm sorry, after Tupac is shot, the conflict takes it place. The conflict takes it takes a um, takes place back on the streets of Compton, and there's a war going on. Uh, Suge Knight obviously now has lost not only his bodyguard Jake Robles after the shooting in Atlanta, now he's lost Tupac in Las Vegas, and uh, you know, for all intent and purposes, they're kind of losing the war, and so. You know, he knows that he has to answer um, for the murder of Tupac. And so he sets things in motion in order to have Biggie killed. Now, keep in mind, after Tupac was shot in Las Vegas, a rumor started. And, you know, very much like the rumor of these chains. Hey, listen, I'll give you $10,000. Puffy's offering $10,000 if you get a death row chain. Well, that, that, that rumor becomes reality on the streets. And it's just like after Tupac is shot in Vegas... Rumor starts that Biggie had been in Vegas, that Biggie had hired the Southside Crips, that Biggie had provided the gun to kill Tupac. And so that rumor becomes reality. And so now Biggie gets targeted because of this bad information that the streets accept as true information. And so that's that's how Biggie got himself in the middle of it. And Bad Boy Records had a false sense of false sense of security coming back to Los Angeles so soon because A, Tupac's gone, B, B Suge Knight's in jail. And so they figure, hey, the streets are clear. You know, the beef is the beef is over. And they come here with a false sense of security. And that's, they made that fatal mistake. When was the Soul Train Awards? Was that before Big, uh, Tupac's death or after? When it, uh, Suge Knight was on the stage giving it uh, West Side and... Um, that was, you don't want yeah, that was, that was before Tupac was murdered. Yeah, so that, that fueled a lot of things as well because that's when things went kind of all over the news, newspapers. That he yeah, you've got Sh Suge Knight publicly disrespecting Biggie. I'm sorry, uh, Suge Knight publicly disrespecting Puffy and Bad Boy in New York. And so again, this is just young guys with big egos, um, you know, kicking and, and, and kicking and screaming at each other, and it just. Spiraled out of control. Where does Kevin Gaines and Frank Liga come into this? Two police officers. Did one of them not get killed? Were they? Was Kevin Lane's not having an affair with one of Suge Knight's girlfriends? Well, I don't know if you'd call it an affair. They were having a relationship. Um, she was estranged. This is Sharitha Knight. She was estranged from Suge. She they weren't really dating, even though she was still involved in some death row activities as a as an administrator so to speak. She was still kind of managing Snoop. And um, so she starts dating this cop named Kevin Gaines and they have a relationship going on. Well, aside from everything, because, you know, Kevin Gaines had nothing to do with death row. He had nothing to do with death row security, he had nothing to do with anything other than he's dating Sharitha Knight. Well, he gets into a road rage incident with another off-duty cop named Frank Liga and they pull guns on each other. Frank pulls his trigger first and kills Kevin Gaines. So that's an isolated incident of road rage between two off-duty LAPD officers. And, uh, well, Frank Ligo was actually on duty, uh, but he was undercover. And um, so that it's an isolated incident, but people try to connect that somehow to death row records or connect it somehow to these murders, and it's just a bunch of nonsense. Yeah, so that does, is that relevant to was the case? It had nothing to do with anything. That, that shooting was an isolated incident between uh, two guys that uh, um, bumped into each other on the street. Neither of them knew the other one was a cop. And um, one thing led to another, and one of them ended up dead. So when Biggie, avenged, when Biggie gets murdered, then what, what's the procedure after that? Like, why has it took so long for like, two high-profile names killed on the streets to then unsolved? Does that put a lot of pressure then on uh, police department to then try and get answers? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you're always trying to figure out what happened. I mean, that's your that's your goal as a homicide investigator is to try to figure out what happened. 
But when people aren't cooperating or you're not getting the information that you need in order to solve the case, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. You can't force people to talk. You can't put them into a room and waterboard them. And, uh, you know, so if, if people don't cooperate, it's going to be very difficult to solve a case. And when you're dealing with gangs and the gang culture, they don't cooperate for all intent and purpose. And so there's, you know, uh, the majority of gang crimes in Los Angeles go unsolved for that reason. These just happen to be a couple of high profile guys whose names um, are brought, you know, or, or demand a lot of public attention, but it's just gang nonsense. And uh, it's oftentimes the case that you don't solve gang crimes. Do you think if Tupac and Biggie were still living longer, do you think gang violence would have got worse? Because then it's divided. It's not just divided a few gangs, like a few people in the gang, you're talking thousands and thousands. Do you think violence would have erupted more if those two were still alive? No, I mean, obviously it got worse because they were dead. I mean, there would never have been a war between the mob Pyrus and the Southside Crips if Tupac had not been shot and killed. So their deaths actually made it worse. Not, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the gang violence, the localized gang violence between the gangs that were affiliated with those two record labels, um, it got worse. Now, had they survived, then it, then who's to say what would have happened? Maybe they figure out a way to squash the beef. Maybe they figure out a way to, um, to work things out. Who knows? It's really difficult to try to speculate what, why, what would have happened if they survived. So the two-pack murder you've solved, but how did you solve that? Was Keefe D, how, how does he come into play? Was he not up for um, getting, sent to a, getting sent for a life sentence, but you made him a deal? Is that correct? Yeah, we made a deal with Keith PD. Uh, he confessed to his role in the murder of Tupac. He said he was in Las Vegas. He's the one that got the gun. He's the one that was in the car with his nephew. He's the one that handed the gun to his nephew. And the nephew leaned out the window and shot Tupac. So that's all pretty much cut and clear. That's the uh, generally accepted um, explanation for Tupac's murder. Um, but with Keith D, you know, we had made a deal with him that if he told us the truth about that, that we would take consideration into all the drug charges that he was facing. And so that's what happened. He, he made a deal and uh, told us the story of what happened, confessed to it. But within that deal um, in Los Angeles, I'm sorry, in a American law enforcement, we have what's known as a proffer agreement. And this is where uh, a defendant, a potential defendant can agree to cooperate with the authorities under the uh, understanding that you can't use what he's saying against him. You can use what he's saying against others. If other people provide you evidence against that person, you can use that, but you can't use his self-incriminating statements. It's part of our kind of like a fifth amendment type of protection. So that's the agreement. We're like, hey, Keefe D, we really want to know what happened. If you tell us what happened, whatever you tell us won't be used against you. That was how that went. But then he goes out, starts to publicly talk about his involvement. He writes a book. He does interviews. None of that information is protected and can be used against him and should be used against him. But thus far, Las Vegas um, just doesn't feel like they can successfully prosecute a case where the defendant is also the, the only witness against the same defendant, which is himself. It's very complicated. Yeah, would he? So, did he ever go to prison, Keefe D? He's been to prison several times. Yeah, did they go after they made the deal though, or to get his sentence cut down, or was the deal tell us what you know and you'll not go to prison? No, that wasn't the deal. The deal was that just cooperate us and we'll take into consideration um, these charges against you. Ultimately, the United States Attorney's Office never filed the drug charges against him. However, Keefe D did go to jail, um, not, you know, I think a couple of years after this confession, he ended up getting caught with a gun and some, uh, I think at the time, marijuana, when marijuana was still illegal. And uh, he did a short prison term as a result of that. But he's never faced, he's never went to jail for the drug charges that we brought him in on in order to gain his cooperation. How accurate do you believe his story, Keefe D? I believe the story he told us was 100% accurate. 
And so when you think then you've solved the case, which has been going on for many years, what year was this, Greg? So that would have been late 2008, early 2009. Yeah. And so again, what he was telling us was just the obvious. Like it was always obvious that Orlando Anderson was the likely assailant against Tupac. So when Keefe tells us this, it's not a big revelation. It's just like, okay, yeah, well, obviously that's, that's the story. But now we had an eyewitness um, and co- co-conspirator actually telling us what the story was. So now we're going to Biggie's uh, murder case where, was it Suge Knight who paid? Is it is it Pucci? Pucci, yeah. Correct? Yeah, mm-hmm. so what's Suge Knight's in, um, association to Pucci? Who has Pucci? Is he a trigger man? Yeah, Pucci was a known trigger man. He was a known, he was a gang member. Um, used to hang out uh, with Suge to some degree. Uh, he was a person that a lot of people uh, understood to be a shooter. He had been involved in other shootings. He is wanted in other murders. And he definitely fit the profile of somebody who would have done this type of thing for Suge Knight. So then we get another female or we get another co-conspirator who uh, was involved in the deal to have Biggie murdered. And that was Suge Knight's girlfriend. And she tells us, listen, Suge asked me to hire Pucci to kill Biggie in retaliation for the murder of Tupac. I went and I met with Pucci. Pucci agreed to do it. There was an agreement over money and that set everything in motion. So there's three people. You got Suge Knight, Pucci, and the girlfriend, and the three of them conspire to kill Biggie. So they wait. They, you know, Everybody knew where Biggie was. He's in Los Angeles. He's showing up around town. And the information about him going to the uh, Peterson Auto Museum the night he shot um, becomes, uh, you know, becomes uh, common knowledge. So Pucci goes there and whether there, there may have been another co-conspirator, we just don't know if Pucci was operating alone or not that night. Um, and the next thing you know, Biggie's getting shot. How um, hard is that for you, Greg, that Orlando... Anderson is dead, Pucci's dead. Like, do you think you'll ever really get any closure towards two Pat and Biggie case? A conviction even? Well, I, I have closure. I mean, I'm 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 completely convinced that the these two guys were responsible for the murders. And if you look at justice through an eye for an eye, then perfect justice prevailed. They were both killed in the same way that they killed Tupac and Biggie. They were both shot down in the streets. So, you know, that's closure for me. Um, but whether the public ever gets closure, um, that's, that's a different question. There's never going to be, um, a judicial, um, uh, there's never going to be a judicial reckoning where people go to court ever. It's, it's 25 years later, almost everybody's dead. And so they're never going to get closure if they're waiting to see somebody get convicted. Did you ever reach out to Suge Knight? And have a discussion with him or a chat. Do you think he would ever speak to you? No, Suge Knight's not ever going to sit down and tell the truth to law enforcement. You got to understand who Suge Knight is and the nature of Suge Knight. I mean, he's uh, Suge Knight is about Suge Knight, and Suge Knight's about Suge Knight only. He doesn't give a shit about justice. He doesn't give a shit about honoring Tupac's memory by helping the police solve that. He doesn't give a shit about you know Biggie Smalls. Uh, to, you know, Suge Knight's never going to, you know, quote unquote, do the right thing because Suge Knight's not that kind of person. Suge Knight's a bad person whose intention is to do everything he can for himself, even at the expense of others. So Suge Knight, he seemed to have got a lot with, he seemed to have got away with a lot of things. Do you think mm-hmm. he had um, paid police officers working for him? Well, yeah, but not that got him out of trouble. I mean, Suge Knight got out of trouble because he had really good lawyers. That's really what kept Suge Knight um, above water for a long time. But then, you know, ultimately his Suge Knight's karma, so to speak, caught up with him. And he's on video running a guy over um, on a a conflict that he helped to um, exacerbate. You know, he created an issue and that issue led to a confrontation. That confrontation led to him running somebody over. He ran two people over, actually, but he killed one. And so Suge Knight's past caught up with him and uh, and he should be in prison and he should be in prison for the rest of his life. 
um, if you think about all the things that he did. But regarding the officers that he was affiliated with, he wasn't really affiliated with cops. His head of security, who was an ex-cop, hired cops to work security at death row. And so you had cops that were moonlighting, um, but Suge's real security was his gang members. The cops were just there as kind of exterior security, visual security. But when things had to get handled, he didn't use the cops to do it. He used his gang members to do it. You know, Suge Knight yeah. didn't, you know, it's not, it's not like Suge Knight trusted cops to be his confidants and to do his dirty work. He didn't need them, nor would he have trusted him to do that. And you have Reggie Wright Jr., who has the security company. And of course, who's he going to hire? He's going to hire his buddies and the people that he knows from law enforcement who can carry guns legally as part of the protective wing of death row records. The gang members can't carry guns legally. How did, why did Suge Knight say injected easy e with AIDS? How, is that another myth or just, that just rumors? Uh, I, I think it's ridiculous on the face of it. I mean, come on. Um, of course, that rumor is out there. That myth is out there. People believe it. But, I mean, let's, you know, let's get reasonable. Suge Knight's going to go inject him with AIDS. Come on. Greg. I'm not going to fucking bullshit you, brother. I believed all that. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I, f- I know, mate. Like, I, we're only in the UK watching it and seeing the documentaries and watching all the stuff. And, like, why would you go on live TV and see that? Like, humans, as a human, you kind of, you think it's a bit far-fetched, but it's it's always question marks. And it, that's why, that all, this ain't just about Biggie and Tupac. There's like, so many different people connected from this, it's so messy, but it's still so intriguing. Like, I still listen to two-pack music to this day. Yeah. Yeah, you know I mean? Yeah, I mean so, <clears throat> you know, when you're on the outside looking in, yeah, you can, a lot of this can kind of lead you to believe that all these fantastic things happen and all of these sophisticated type of, you know, organized yeah, <laughs> you know, it's not that way, man. These are just gangsters acting like gangsters and, uh, and, and getting away with a lot because of the gang world that they live in that protects itself. Um, it's it, it, some of this stuff just gets really in, 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 insanely um, strange. Uh, that's all I can say about it. I mean, all of this is really pretty simple. None of these guys are rocket scientists, um, which, which is why most of them are either dead or in jail. And, uh, you know, it's just the culture of that, of that time. Um, but no, and, you know, and going and getting a syringe full of AIDS and sneaking up and freaking easy with it. It's like, come on, that's not the way this shit works. Yeah. But as it's a conspiracy theory mindset as well, where you're thinking, did he not beat Easy E up though to sign a contract, and then because the AIDS came so quick that people are saying it's because it was injected into his system so quick? So in my mind, I'm thinking, shit, that stuff, that America's nuts. Like, it's crazy here in the UK, Greg, but America's a different fucking level, man. He's a psychopath <laughs> over there. <laughs> well, we do. We have our share of psychopaths. There's no doubt about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can, you can, this is what happens with conspiratorial thinking is that you just like, oh, here's this and here's this. And well, they must have something to do with each other. So let's connect them and then develop a theory where this has something to do with this. But it's often not the case. These are just, you know, there's, there's coincidences that happen. There's, um, you know, you can, you can connect, you, you can, you can put dots on a piece of paper and draw and, and connect those and make a, a thousand different pictures, you know? depending on how you want to connect the dots. And, um, and this is the problem with conspiratorial thinking is that they see a bunch of dots and they try to figure out how to force fit them to work together, to draw a picture that they've already formed in their mind. And uh, th- that's just not how investigations work. Yeah. That's not how truth works. And so, you know, we have to deal with facts and evidence and when things don't fit, then you, you set them aside. Yeah. P. Did, did, did he not come out and call you a liar for something? Uh, I don't know if it was that strong. I mean, obviously, P. Diddy's going to, um, uh, you know, P. Diddy's not going to s- step up and say, hey, okay, listen, all this shit's true. Of course, he's not going to do that. Who would in his position? You know, um, 
So yeah, he's, I, I, I think that P Diddy is, if P Diddy really thought I was a liar, it would have been very easy for him to have his attorney go down to the courthouse and file a defamation lawsuit against me. Um, I think P Diddy knows that what I'm saying is true. I also add the caveat that I think P Diddy was in over his head. He was caught up in a situation that he couldn't control. He made some bad decisions and, uh, but I don't think P Diddy was out there trying to get anybody hurt. I don't think he was out there trying to get anybody murdered. I don't think he understood exactly the nature of the beast that he was dealing with. And when he's dealing with these gang members, he doesn't fully aware of what they a are capable of a or B willing to do by way of just a casual conversation. So if he's telling these guys like, shit, I'm up to my neck with Suge Knight and Tupac and, you know, they're trying to hunt me down and I'm scared and I don't know what to do. And I wish somebody would take care of these. And will you guys take care of this for me? I'll do whatever you need. Just, you know, that kind of desperate talking, um, not actually believing or wanting or intending that these things would be carried out. I don't think that P Diddy wanted Tupac murdered in any way, shape or form, but he's dealing with people who um, are willing to do that type of thing. And then when one of them gets assaulted, they're like, Hey, you know what? Diddy kind of wants this done. We're going to do it anyways, because we just had our guy get his ass kicked. So we have to retaliate. If there's an added benefit of, you know, helping uh, uh, Puffy out, then, then the, the, that's the, that's the, that's all that happened. How long did you stay on the case for Greg? Uh, a little over just three years, uh, 2006 to 2009. Was that your biggest case unsolved? No, no, actually not. I worked another case that was even more complicated, another high profile case. Um, and not me, but a team of people. And it was a much longer case. Um, it was a case that had been investigated years and years and years and years. So, no, but it was the most notable case as far as notoriety. The Biggie and Tupac cases were the most popular as far as the public perception. Yeah, because you wrote the book, is it Murder Rap? Yeah, yeah. Mo- and wrote and t- Murder Back. Mm-hmm. And, they, and, they, and they turned that into films and documentaries, the, the 10-part series on Netflix? Correct. It's amazing, though, that it's still it's amazing footage as well. It is so intriguing that, like I've said, that people are still so intrigued by it because there isn't any conviction. Like, can you still understand that as well? That like, you might have all the answers, but for people looking at the outside, there's still so many conspiracies out there. That like, Tupac's living in Cuba and like all yeah. the telltale signs where the Machiavelli, that like, he comes back from the dead, and it is it is very appealing. Can you still understand that, though? Or are you just going? Straight detective and no, let's shut up. That's just pure bullshit. Well, I can do both. I mean, I realize that there's, you know, a lot of people out there that are, you know, um, attaching themselves to conspiracy theories. And there's people that are out there thinking Tupac's alive. There's people that are out there thinking that should killed Tupac. There's people that are out there thinking the government killed Tupac. There's people that are out there thinking the police killed Biggie. So, you know, there's all of these different points of view. Um, I know what I know. And I believe what I believe. And so I'm settled with that. And I speak about that, you know, whenever I'm asked to, um, but I'm, I'm completely at peace with the whole thing. Uh, it's an unfortunate set of circumstances. I'm glad Orlando and, and, uh, and Pucci um, were held accountable, at least in a, in a divine way, um, you know, that they, that they've suffered the consequences of their actions and so I'm, I'm cool with it, but, um, if people want to attach themselves and have never ending conspiracy theories that are constantly changing and, and modifying 25 years later, you know, you can't control that. You ought to let people be who they're going to be and believe what they want to believe and accept that they're never going to convince everybody of the truth. Did you ever speak to Tupac's mom or Biggie's mom when you were investigating the case? Yeah, I spoke with Biggie's uh, mom several times and, she uh, seems a nice it, woman. She's beautiful. She's wonderful, Warren. She's really, she's she's really kind of the last standing victim in all of this. Yeah, it must be tough though. That well, you see the the video of uh, Biggie's funeral and everybody out in the street and playing his music. That like, you're forgetting the victims, even though people are still so intrigued. You're forgetting about the mums and the family members and friends who were so close to these individuals. That like, like it's such such a big case. Like such big cases. Like what was the 
the Rampar scandal as well, Greg, like the 400 million, what was that? How was that involved in these cases? The la- yeah, the Rampart scandal had nothing to do with this. Um, it was an independent thing. It had to do with some guys like uh, um, that were out there putting themselves above the law, cops that were dirty. Um, the Rampart scandal was this umbrella idea that there was this whole group of people. Well, you know, once the smoke cleared, it came down to really just a couple of people uh, that were bad apples. And they were exposed and they were sent to prison and held accountable and lost their jobs. And so the Rampart scandal is an independent, isolated, uh, somewhat um, um, event in the history of the LAPD. Um, the $400 million thing, that came up in Biggie's case. That had nothing to do with the Rampart scandal. That was just a, a number that was thrown out there by a judge during a pretrial hearing where the judge is like, well, if any of these allegations prove to be true, this would be the amount of money that possibly could be um, um, charged against the city. And so, yeah, but of course that lawsuit fell apart too. And there was never a dime paid in uh, as a result of that lawsuit against the city. In fact, the attorneys for Valletta Wallace retracted their lawsuit because they were tired of wasting money chasing um, false narratives. Yeah. Do you ever think there'll be something as big as this between two hip hop stars? Like, yeah, I know the game and Fifty Cent kind of had a bit of beef. Was there ever concern that that could have erupted the way it did with Biggie and Tupac? Well, I think that the people in the industry kind of learned a lesson from Biggie and Tupac, saying, "Man, listen, sometimes we can, you know, uh, create controversy, and that controversy sells records." And so we can, you know, so they started doing like fake beefs, actually, where rappers and stuff would kind of coordinate beefs in order to give the impression the public like, well, wow, the game is beefing with this guy or whatever. But I think that the industry learned also that like, Hey, we've got to be real careful that this doesn't get taken too far because look at the consequences, you know, look at how this affected this record company. Look at how this affected this record company when it's two artists, it's two primary artists um, are shot and killed. And then we lose this talent and uh, and we lose the potential that they have to produce more stuff down the road. So I think the industry started to realize, like, man, look how quickly this got out of hand with, you know, Bad Boy Records and Death Row Records. Let's try to avoid that. I mean, I'm hoping that's the mindset of yeah. of, of, of CEOs. Or you, might be, or you might be coming out of retirement again, Greg. No, not me, man. I'm done. I, you know, I... <laughs> when i left the police department i never looked back you know it had served its purpose for my life you know i did 25 years i worked on some great cases i had a great career i got a great pension and and then a new chapter opened and uh so now i'm in that chapter and uh i don't look back and i certainly would never jump back into um into that world as you know professionally as an investigator with an agency yeah. Although I do have my own private investigations company, so it kind of sounds a little bit contradictory. But, you know, just the the bureaucracy and the red tape and the politics of policing these days, and not just these days, but even back then, um, it wears you down. And, uh, and once you're liberated from that, it's hard to imagine ever going back and working under those conditions again. Yeah, like I say, you've done a amazing. You've had an amazing career, man. You've done a lot of good as well in the world, Greg. Like you look back at Tupac, and I watch his old videos when, like, he was an actor and a poet, and some of his songs are really powerful to this day. Like, it's sad to then go down that other route, and because um, he thought he was a gangster when he wasn't. Do you think that's because he was surrounding himself by gangsters as well that he just tried to put the act on, like he was acting that part? You know, I think that had Tupac again, I. As I mentioned earlier, if he had survived that shooting, um, it's going to be a different Tupac. It's going to be a Tupac that is um, physically uh, going to be living a, a, a much more challenging life, you know, trying to live life with one lung and having to uh, try to recover from the, um, the effects of that shooting. So had he lived, it would have been really, really interesting to see what he would have done with himself. And if Biggie had lived, it would have been interesting to see what he had done with himself. Um, and it's just too, it's too bad that those guys couldn't rectify their issues and those labels didn't rectify their issues before 
um, before the, you know, before these, these events happened. So I, I don't know, um, to answer your question, James, um, I would have loved to have met Tupac, you know, after learning who he was and trying to understand him and putting myself in the middle of this conflict, um, trying to understand, you know, to understand what happened. Um, I, I would have loved to have met both of them. And uh, I, you know, I obviously developed a newfound appreciation for the music and the talent that was involved. Um, but it is what it is. You know, you can't change history, so to speak. And so you got to just appreciate them and in, in, in the legacies that they've left behind. Yeah. Can you understand the music now in some of the lyrics that why people can relate to them so much? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I've, I'm, I'm more sensitive to um, what they were trying to say, what that voice is trying to say and understanding it, not always agreeing with it, but at least understanding it. And uh, yeah, so um, it's, it's been a privilege to work on their cases. I wish I never had to, um, but it is, you know, since it happened, I'm, 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 I feel like I was privileged to be able to, to work on their cases and to bring some resolution to them. Yeah, how does that change your life, Greg, then, for being a detective, trying to solve crimes, to then being a celebrity, basically, because everybody then wants a piece of you because you are known worldwide, working on the biggest unsolved cases on the planet. Like, everybody knows who the, what the case was, but how does that then change your life to then people want to interview you and make documentaries and books? Like, is that a good thing? Obviously, it's a good thing because you're creating awareness. You're, you're, it's a business as well, but... How does that change your life to try to be under the radar to then be in the limelight? Well, that was an, you know, that was a, a process, you know, there's a learning curve there. Um, you know, typically when you are working on cases, you try to keep that information close to the best. You try to protect your investigation. You don't want to getting compromised. So you keep things very close. And then now all of a sudden you're on the other end where like, you're sharing all the information with everybody. <laughs> and so uh, there was a learning curve to figure out how to um, engage and, um, um, and it responsibly try to do this as responsible as possible and as respectfully as possible. Um, but the benefit is I've get to meet great people. I've got to meet, you know, just like today uh, here, I'm talking to a guy on the other side of the Atlantic ocean um, who's, you know, sitting in the middle of uh, what it's like eight o'clock at night for you right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just woke up, I'm having my <laughs> coffee. And so uh, it's, it's a lot of fun and you get to, you, and, and some of the people that you meet now become long-term friends. You know, um, I have a lot of friends now that I've met only as a result of this investigation. And so it's, it's, it's added to the quality of my life. Um, but obviously it's at the expense of two, of two people. And so it's bittersweet, but you know, I'm, I'm thankful that, um, the conversation is still being, being had. I'm thankful that people still, um, care enough about these two gentlemen to, to want to, to want to talk about it and learn about it. So it's, it's yeah. been a, an interesting journey, but like you said, it's mostly positive. Yeah. So, Let's go a full roundup on it all, Greg. What's all the evidence you have and everything that you've got on the full uh, Tupac and Biggie murder? Yeah, so the um, I think the the Tupac and Biggie murder. I'm sorry, the Tupac murder is pretty clear. Like for any rational thinking person, you can look at the facts and the evidence and the information. And you're going to draw the same conclusion: is that Tupac put himself in a position where um, he shouldn't have been. Um, he got himself involved in gang activity. That gang activity ultimately came back and bite him on the ass and got him killed. Orlando Anderson shot and killed Tupac Shakur on September 7th, 1996 in Las Vegas. Orlando Anderson is your murderer. Biggie was killed as a retaliation of that. And Biggie um, Suge Knight hired a guy named Pucci to go and kill Biggie in retaliation for the shooting of Tupac. And whether or not Pucci operated alone is the one unknown. We don't know that. There's a good chance that there was somebody else involved, but we've never positively identified that person. But Pucci, Suge Knight, and a female um, girlfriend of, of Suge Knight's all conspired to kill Biggie. 
that's where all the evidence points, that's where all the facts are. The idea that there's this other, you know, um, conspiracy with police officers, when you really understand the ingredients of that claim in that conspiracy, it all falls apart. But people tend to want to believe it. They like the idea because it's a bigger story. It's more scandalous and sensational. So a lot of people want to accept that, um, but they don't understand how investigations work. They don't understand why that isn't a plausible explanation anymore. And so that's where we're at with it. I'm settled with that being the truth. That is the truth I'm going to continue to promote. And uh, again, like I'm coming over to the UK, hopefully in May and going on a speaking tour. And I'll be putting those facts and evidence up on the board for people to to um, to evaluate. And where is your tour? We'll touch on that. And I'll put that at the very start as well, uh, Greg, so people can get involved. So your tour, how many countries are you doing? How many cities are you doing in the UK? Uh, we're doing eight, I think seven cities, two in London. We're starting in Scotland. Um, I think Edinburgh is the first city. And then um, from Edinburgh... Let me pull this up real quick. If all right, so Glasgow. That's and, where I'm from, uh, brother. Yeah, man. I'll see you first. Yeah, Are you'll see gonna... me first. Yeah, okay. yeah. We'll get a catch up. I want you. Oh, yeah. I want you meet. Yeah, get a proper catch up, bro. I'll get you some good Scottish food. Good, perfect. And what about good Scottish beer? You have that. <laughs> mate, whiskey, mate. You'll fucking blow the tits off you. You're better <laughs> drinking that after though your show, <laughs> or you won't make the rest of the tour. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Glasgow at a place called the platform at the arches, I guess platform at the arches yeah. that's on. So that's on May 10th and then Edinburgh on May 12th and then Manchester uh, May 14th and then Birmingham and then a couple of nights in London. So all of this happens in uh, middle of May and it uh, looks like we're going to do eight different locations or eight different uh, speaking engagements. Um, so it's going to be great. Yeah. I can't wait. I hope that you, I hope that we can make it. Yeah, you, you as well. Everything's starting to open up here. Can you send me the link as well so I can leave it in the description, Greg? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just I before will. we finish up, brother, um, the two pack and Biggie's mum meet each other. They came. Out, they came. They they spoke to each other. Did they not come face to face? Oh. That's a great question, and I should I should know that, but I don't. I, I'm assuming that they, at the very least, talked. I'm confident that they have talked before. I don't know that they've ever met face-to-face. Um, obviously, we lost Afini Shakur a couple of years ago. Um, she's no longer around. Um, Valletta Wallace is still alive, um, but, you know, she's been kind of She's got some of her own health issues. Um, I don't know if they've ever met face to face to answer your question. Uh, and last question: Do you think Suge Knight can ever get done for conspiracy to murder? No, I don't think Suge Knight's ever going to get charged for conspiracy to commit murder. The only person that could really testify him at this point, testify against him at this point, is his girlfriend. Uh, I don't think that she's ever going to be willing to do that. Um, and even if she did, she has her own credibility issues because she's got a long criminal history of her own. So it wouldn't be a very likely prosecution. So I don't think that Suge Knight will ever be held accountable uh, for his role in Biggie's murder in a court of law. Um, but I hope that he is held accountable in um, some other way. You know, I hope that the universe will um, hold him accountable and perhaps that's why he's probably going to die in prison as a result of the case that he's in, um, incarcerated in for now. Yeah. Greg, would you like to finish up on anything, brother? No, just that um, I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. I appreciate you having me on the podcast today. And, uh, and I appreciate the conversation. I really do. And uh, I, I think this conversation is still going to be being had 10 years from now. Yeah, definitely. It's such a powerful case because it is still unsolved and through the court system, like it's just mega. Like in the UK, it's mega. Like you'll see that here when you go to your shows. Like people will love them, and we'll make sure we promote this well as well on all my social media platforms. But once you're in Glasgow, we'll get a catch up. I'll take you get some good food, and um, it'll be good to see you, brother. But thank you um, for coming on today and being so early. Cause I know you only had a few hours sleep. I thoroughly, I genuinely appreciate it, and thoroughly enjoyed your conversation. But God bless you, brother, and Thank I'll drop you. you a message. Send me the links as well, please, and we'll catch up when you're in Glasgow, brother. 
I appreciate you, James. Thank you very much, man. Yeah. Have a great day, and uh, we'll, you, see, we'll see you in a few months. Yeah, yeah. God bless you, Greg. All right, buddy. Soon, Thanks bro. a lot. Take care. Right. Bye. Bye.